I, I can't believe we've come to the uh, last presentation of the afternoon. It gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce Thomas Guzik. I'm sure many of you know Thomas. Um, he's been a Regis uh, professor at the University of Glasgow since 2013. Um, I'm particularly interested in Thomas's talk because I have a great interest in, in the vasculature um, and immune responses and I think this is a, a really uh, great opportunity to bring the vasculature to uh, COVID-19. So Thomas, I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, this invitation and uh, for uh, congratulations on such an interesting uh, symposium. I have already learned a lot here, so thank you to uh, all the uh, speakers. Uh, so I was uh, asked to talk about uh, the relationships or links between immunopathology of cardiovascular disease and uh, immunopathology of COVID as, uh, as a sort of immune-mediated uh, disease as it is. And it is a difficult task because uh, the amount of data that we have of various uh, uh, quality is enormous. Uh, we organized a symposium uh, during the recent ESC Congress at which uh, Eric Rubin from New England Journal uh, uh, talk and, uh, um, and talked about the number of submissions that New England Journal receives, and you can appreciate that uh, through the first half of the year, they received nearly 14,000 papers submitted to uh, New England Journal on different topics related to COVID-19. Therefore, it is actually quite difficult to uh, uh, synthesize uh, uh, very briefly uh, all the knowledge that's available, and I will focus on comparisons between certain aspects of immunopathology of uh, COVID-19 that we have learned over the last few months, and uh, immunopathology of uh, cardiovascular disease, with particular focus on hypertension, which is my personal uh, interest of my lab. Um, COVID-19, the virus is, uh, is, is, is the SARS-CoV is shown here, and uh, we have heard uh, quite a lot uh, from a previous speaker, uh, very, very detailed uh, mechanisms of uh, viral entry into various cells. Uh, various uh, cell types express ACE2, as we have heard, and uh, lead to um, clinical manifestations. But we must not forget that the main clinical manifestation, while we are all interested in cardiovascular system, is actually pulmonary. And people die uh, mainly because of ARDS. But uh, while these uh, manifestations are uh, most important, uh, we have to appreciate the heterogeneous course of the disease, as well as different personalized responses that uh, different people develop uh, in response to the virus, which is relatively unique and uh, unusual. Uh, what uh, 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 is particularly interesting uh, to us is the relationship between cardiovascular comorbidities and uh, COVID-19 severity and COVID-19 prevalence. Already through very early studies, we could learn that cardiovascular disease and in particular certain cardiovascular risk factors can be uh, associated with uh, increased risk of COVID-19 and increased risk of severity, even to the greater extent, interestingly, than presence of COPD or other lung diseases. Of course, these, many of these studies were criticized because of their observational, retrospective nature, because of the fact that, in fact, as we heard uh, uh, already, aging uh, is a, a common characteristic to all of these comorbidities, and it is one of the most, uh, one of the strongest predictors of severe course of many viral diseases, not only of COVID-19. Many of these studies were not uh, using proper statistical adjustments, but with time we accumulated more and more, a little bit more reliable studies. And in recent meta-analysis, still on MedRivix, we can see that uh, there is a signal for increased risk of uh, uh, COVID in patients with cardiovascular disease, and in particular with two risk factors, hypertension and diabetes. Um, I think about a month ago, a, a very interesting observational study was published from a relatively large group of patients with and without hypertension, uh, which actually used appropriate adjustments to uh, um, classical other factors that could be confounding. Uh, they have uh, quite uh, carefully characterized the, the patients and uh, found that uh, hazard ratios uh, for uh, COVID-19 mortality as well as severe uh, clinical outcomes uh, have been significantly increased in hypertensive patients in, uh, also in an adjusted models for age, other uh, risk factors, as well as in a very carefully matched propensity score adjusted model. Uh, that is uh, quite uh, convincing and uh, uh, is reflected by uh, Kaplan-Meier curves uh, showing survival uh, uh, rates 
in patients with and without hypertension, uh, showing very clearly that hypertension is actually a risk factor uh, in COVID-19 on a clinical level. This, of course, brought uh, a question that uh, I met during the first uh, two months uh, of uh, um, pandemic, uh, every time I saw any uh, of my patients in hypertension clinic, they would always ask me to stop ACE inhibitor or uh, um, ARB. Uh, of course, uh, already very early, we knew that evidence is uh, not substantial for this and we were not doing this. And now we have both uh, observational, as shown here, uh, data that actually antihypertensive medications, so better control of blood pressure, as well as uh, RAS inhibitors are beneficial in COVID-19, reducing uh, uh, mortality and uh, uh, severity of the disease rather than uh, making things worse. So it's actually quite good that our recommendation to the patients was always to keep uh, these medications. But when we think how, what could be the mechanisms uh, uh, evoking changes in the cardiovascular system, both on the level of uh, myocardium as well as blood vessels uh, in relation to increased risk of acute coronary syndromes in patients with COVID-19, we uh, cannot ignore uh, immune system and inflammation. We can see that in this cartoon, the central stage is taken by cytokine storm, a characteristic feature of the patients developing severe uh, COVID-19 uh, 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 clinical uh, outcomes. Uh, therefore, a number of studies have tried to characterize immune phenotypes of patients with COVID-19, and I will show you only two uh, selected ones uh, that uh, uh, were published in the last uh, two months. In this uh, paper published in Science, the authors uh, analyzed the patients with COVID-19 and healthy and recovered donors uh, in comp uh, when, and compared a relatively large number of various immune uh, phenotypic parameters, including cytokine levels, as well as uh, immune cell uh, populations. These studies have allowed them to actually identify three distinct immunophenotypes of the disease. Then, then they try to link to clinical features uh, uh, of uh, COVID-19. As you may remember from early time of pandemic, the key feature of rapid deterioration in patients with uh, uh, COVID-19 is actually not only increased CRP or elevated inflammatory markers reflecting the cytokine storm, but interestingly enough, progressive deterioration of lymphocyte counts. If you think about this, then we should think, well, in cardiovascular disease, we actually see uh, increased activation and presence of uh, leukocytes and high blood cell counts are actually increasing the risk of cardiovascular disease or uh, are a biomarker of that. So uh, uh, what could be uh, the reason for, uh, for this and how could we explain uh, this uh, uh, sort of potential discrepancy? Firstly, in the science paper, they confirmed that the majority of lymphocytes C cells, B cells, as well as specific CD4 and CD8 cells overall in the whole population are decreased. But when they looked at the immunophenotypes, only immunophenotype three was actually particularly associated with the decreased T cells and B or B cells, while immunophenotype one was characterized by the presence of highly activated CD4 and CD8 cells. So even if we have reduced numbers of cells in peripheral blood, that may be the case because of uh, uh, chemotactic recruitment of cells into the uh, uh, inflamed organs or uh, due to other uh, uh, sort of immune-related events, but still uh, we can see that a large proportion of these cells, much larger proportion in patients with COVID-19 uh, uh, presenting clinically uh, is uh, uh, actually activated or showing a, a phenotype of effector memory cells or terminally differentiated effector memory cells as shown here. Uh, moreover, many of these cells, and this is shown particularly strongly within the CD8 population, so cytotoxic T cells, that may not be surprising because these cells are very strongly involved in uh, antiviral responses, were uh, uh, actually proliferating uh, and showing features of uh, activation, uh, such as expression of uh, surface markers, such as CD38. So we can see that maybe total T cells uh, may be decreased in the general population of COVID patients, but there are immunophenotypes associated with increased activation of CD8 cells in particular. Moreover, these uh, authors have looked at uh, severity of COVID-19 and prevalence of these activated cells and have shown a relation, positive relationship between these two uh, parameters. <laughs> 
The second study looked at uh, uh, more carefully at uh, different stages of COVID-19 or different presentations of COVID-19 in relation to uh, various immune signature aspects. You can see that uh, when they compared control to COVID-19 patients, they could see a classical uh, sort of immunoglobulin responses uh, to the virus, but also cytokine storm uh, parameters such as IL-6, interleukin-8, but also, interestingly, the same uh, kind of population of cells that was identified in the science paper, which are activated CD8 cells, as well as uh, actively dividing CD4 and CD8 cells of the characteristic of effector memory cells. Moreover, they identified a very strong uh, uh, presence of uh, a chemokine called IP10. And this is interesting because IP10 has been uh, shown to be increased in number of cardiovascular diseases. Uh, as you see, these were only uh, some of the changes, and uh, the, the, these, both of these papers are very large and, uh, and show different uh, subpopulations of uh, white blood cells being altered in uh, uh, COVID-19. But uh, when, if we want to focus on uh, uh, lymphocytes and CD8 cells in particular, they have confirmed uh, again that even in the most severe patients uh, uh, of COVID-19, the, there is actually decrease in total CD8 cells and uh, total lymphocytes in general, in the general population. But similarly to the, uh, uh, to the other uh, authors, they found that activated proliferating cells are more prevalent in patients with severe uh, COVID-19, which uh, is kind of a common feature of this. As I pointed out your attention to IP10, the CXCL10, which is interferon gamma induce, uh, inducible uh, chemotactic protein that uh, chemotactically attracts to sites of inflammation, also to blood vessels, monocytes, macrophages, as well as uh, uh, T cells, uh, we can see that it is very strongly increased in uh, patients with uh, COVID-19, and it has a much stronger relationship to clinical severity, for example, expressed as hospital stay. It's actually a number one biomarker among the immunophenotypes that was studied. So as I emphasized, IP10 is very interesting and I will come back to IP10 as we have uh, seen a role of IP10 uh, particularly strongly in, in recruitment of immune cells into the perivascular space in number of cardiovascular diseases ranging from atherosclerosis to hypertension. So uh, some uh, uh, of the participants asked about the potential relationship between endothelial dysfunction and COVID-19. And indeed, there is not a very strong clinical evidence so far. The studies are small and not very conclusive, but we can clearly uh, say that uh, the presence of a regulation of the number of cytokines that are observed in uh, COVID-19 have been quite convincingly associated with uh, development of endothelial dysfunction. So it may develop if not directly uh, through uh, uh, COVID-19 damage to the endothelium, it may be indirect through the effects mediated by uh, cytokines and cytokine storm and uh, immune cell activation. In the second part uh, of the talk, I will try to make uh, uh, use the knowledge that I presented to you and try to uh, refer it to what we know about pathogenesis of hypertension as an example of cardiovascular disease that is particularly uh, predisposing to development of uh, more severe COVID-19. In the last about 10, 12 years, we have learned quite a lot about uh, the mechanisms of immune dysregulation, immune dysfunction that can modulate uh, uh, blood pressure increase in hypertension, as well as development of target organ damage in this uh, uh, disease. And indeed, in our own studies of hypertensive patients, we can see that there is a very clear uh, group of uh, cytokines, and you can appreciate the uh, similarities uh, to uh, uh, immunophenotype of patients with uh, uh, COVID-19, uh, uh, including interferon gamma, as well as IP10 being quite central in the network of uh, interactions of uh, cytokines in hypertensive individuals. This uh, might be uh, very interesting because if hypertensive patients before they are infected are already exhibiting increased expression of certain cytokines that are essential in COVID-19 response, one can expect that the cytokine storm or cytokine response to the infection might be more pronounced. We still are lacking evidence of that uh, in, uh, uh, in, in uh, uh, direct experiments, but uh, uh, studies are uh, ongoing uh, in that direction. Yeah. <laughs> 
Moreover, our uh, characterization uh, found that uh, similarly to uh, many immune-related diseases, we can see clear immunophenotypes related uh, to various uh, cytokine uh, levels. We can see about 30% of patients showing an overall activation of uh, cytokine-related uh, uh, immune responses, while in uh, uh, about 25-30%, uh, there is practically almost no response uh, uh, related to uh, immune activation. So hypertension will also be heterogeneous uh, if uh, uh, analyzed from the point of view of uh, immunopathogenesis. In order to try to understand a little bit closer the uh, uh, role of immune system in, in hypertension and compare similarities to uh, our differences to uh, uh, what we observe in immunopathogenesis of COVID-19, we can uh, appreciate that, uh, in fact, hypertension is associated with very strong changes of uh, expression of immune-associated genes in blood vessels themselves. We can see that in this uh, gene array, uh, a number of years ago, we observed that the immune system and immune regulation was on a top pathways affected by infusion of angiotensin II. There was no other immune-related or inflammatory stimulus that we would expose these uh, uh, animals to. Moreover, when we took classical immune organs or uh, classical organs involved in hypertension, we can appreciate the number of uh, 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 inflammatory molecules were uh, changed, increased or decreased in these uh, uh, organs, for example, in lymph nodes. This, uh, uh, these changes uh, are, uh, to some level, corresponding to what we would see in uh, autoimmune disease. And in this case, as I emphasize, we kind of just infused angiotensin II and caused a hypertensive challenge to, uh, to these animals. But immune responses, as uh, you have learned from single cell studies that I showed you, and uh, phenotyping are not only about cytokines, are about cells. And we can appreciate that cells indeed infiltrate uh, vasculature of uh, hypertensive animals. We can see that T cells, B cells, macrophages, and dendritic cells are all present uh, abundantly in uh, aortas, mesenteric vessels, and other vessels, uh, especially in perivascular space of, uh, uh, of the vasculature. We can also see this with two-photon microscopy, where we can appreciate they are not only sitting there, but they are actually quite activated and quite active because they move about uh, quite uh, significantly. So uh, the, we asked uh, a question in a small sub-project that we did after COVID-19 uh, uh, broke out, and we decided to use uh, the data that we have in single-cell RNA-seq, uh, looking at uh, uh, various potential receptor expression uh, in immune cells in, uh, in a mouse model. It's, of course, uh, suboptimal, but it's quite interesting because we uh, uh, found that there was completely no ACE2 or temperance in, uh, uh, in any of the immune cells in the blood vessel uh, uh, wall. Uh, which would indicate that if there are any effects of COVID, if there were any effects of COVID-19, they would have to be probably indirect or mediated by potentially other receptors that uh, are expressed on particularly on macrophages uh, within the vessel wall uh, cells. This uh, also corresponds to a, a human study that uh, we published in cardiovascular research at, uh, in, in March, uh, uh, almost uh, at the initiation of, uh, of the pandemic, which showed that in the human heart, ACE2 is primarily expressed in pericytes as well as to some extent in some cardiac myocytes, but is not really present in T cells or macrophages or other immune cells infiltrating uh, uh, human heart. So, uh, we can appreciate that uh, the, the immune uh, uh, pathogenesis is central for uh, a potential link between uh, hypertension. So pre-activated cells would be potentially more prone to develop uh, uh, stronger and more pronounced uh, responses. This could lead to also exacerbation of hypertension, and there are projects ongoing to find out whether uh, hypertension is actually exacerbated in patients who uh, survived uh, COVID-19. The answer is still unknown. But in mice, we can see that uh, T and B lymphocytes do play an important role in regulation of severe hypertension. Mice lacking T and B cells are protected from severe hypertension and vascular dysfunction, oxidative stress associated with it. Moreover, these uh, can be uh, recapitulated in various models of immune deficiencies, which are protected from severe hypertension. This includes mice and rats on the right, uh, a rat one knockout rat in that case. <laughs> 
So uh, if, if this is the case in, uh, in, in mice, what is the, the situation in humans? I have shown you the effects of uh, cytokine, hypertension cytokine levels, but uh, we also performed an immunophenotyping study in very well matched uh, control and hypertensive populations uh, without any confounding immune or other uh, confounding diseases or without target organ damage either. And we can appreciate that memory T cells, and uh, uh, in particularly in both CD4, but particularly in CD8 cells, are overrepresented in, uh, uh, in uh, hypertensive patients. Moreover, a number of effector uh, uh, cell uh, subpopulations are present. We can see a very strong presence of TH17 cells, almost uh, in some patients to the level that would uh, make us suspect autoimmune disease. We have actually followed up these patients uh, five, so for five years after this, uh, this study now, and uh, we can say that none of them have developed clinically uh, uh, visible autoimmune disease. Uh, these are also associated with overproduction of cytokines that are of interest from the point of view of COVID-19, such as interferon gamma or TNF-alpha. But in humans, it's difficult to establish causality, and in order to do this, we use UK Biobank and Mendelian randomization approach. Uh, in first in observational study, we found that uh, lymphocytes, monocytes, neutrophils are all positively associated with blood pressure. The increasing amount of these uh, number of these cells in blood uh, are predictive of higher uh, systolic, diastolic, and pulse pressure. The causality is more difficult to, to prove, but Mendelian randomization can be used and would indicate that diseases that will affect uh, lymphocytes or genetics that affects uh, lymphocyte uh, levels would actually uh, potentially have relationship to development of hypertension. Mendelian randomization allows us to uh, address the question of uh, causal association between exposure and disease using a genetic predisposition that is uh, sort of randomly assigned at birth uh, to the exposure. In this case, uh, uh, of course, we have certain assumptions of lack of unobserved confounders uh, and uh, uh, being associated with the genetic predisposition and no independent association with disease. In our case, we use genetic polymorphisms that predispose to higher or lower levels of uh, lymphocytes, neutrophils, uh, monocytes, for each of them separate uh, analysis was done and analyzed the effect on blood pressure. We use different techniques of Mendelian randomization in order to avoid uh, confounding, uh, uh, because each method is uh, allowing us to avoid certain confounders uh, in a different way than the other. And we can appreciate that lymphocytes were the only uh, cell type consistently associated positively with uh, systolic and diastolic blood pressure, with some signal also coming in eosinophils, while other uh, uh, cell types, even though they were uh, correlated, they were not causally associated. Therefore, we ask the question, is it possible that other cell types are actually affect, uh, affected by blood pressure rather than affecting blood pressure? And we use reverse Mendelian randomization to address this question, confirming that uh, blood pressure affects eosinophils, monocytes, and neutrophils using the same uh, approach. So this proves that in humans, not only uh, uh, subpopulations of lymphocytes are changed, which could affect uh, uh, development of COVID-19, but lymphocytes are actually causally, uh, potentially causally associated with development of hypertension itself. But this is in blood, and I have already emphasized to you that in COVID, for example, blood cells are going down. Why? We still are uncertain, but they might be actually migrating into the vessel wall. And in fact, when we look at the vessel wall of patients, in this case, undergoing bypass graft surgery, we can appreciate uh, a presence of uh, CD8 cells or CD3 cells in this case in peri uh, perivascular space of uh, uh, blood vessels. This is present in both mammary arteries and in coronary arteries, in pericoronary fat. And there are systemic uh, uh, regulators of this process because we see clear correlation between these cells in uh, these two types of blood vessels. But what is particularly interesting is that patients with higher infiltration of particularly CD8 cells, so the cells that are activated in COVID-19, uh, are showing a greater level of uh, endothelial dysfunction. Uh, this is uh, remaining uh, significant after adjustment for major uh, factors uh, that could affect development of endothelial dysfunction. So immune cells can indeed present in the perivascular space mediate development of endothelial dysfunction. 
This can be linked with number of cytokines. And again, I draw your attention to cytokines of interest from the point of view of COVID-19, because number of them are increased in the vessels of patients with high immune cell infiltration. In order to try to understand how this is happening and whether these cells can produce cytokines of interest, we uh, perform some uh, uh, staining uh, flu um, and flow cytometry that uh, showed that the immune cells infiltrating the vessels produce particularly interferon gamma and TNF alpha. These cytokines released from the cells can actually cause endothelial dysfunction. And if, and we are currently conducting a, a study looking in patients post-COVID, uh, if this is the case uh, in, uh, in, in, in COVID patients, then it could explain uh, development of endothelial dysfunction independently from direct invasion from uh, the uh, virus into the endothelial uh, cells. And finally, in a, a few last slides, I would like to draw your attention to the fact that there is a group of uh, CD8 cells that have so far not really been studied in the context of uh, uh, COVID-19 so much, but that increase in, with age and increase with cytomegalovirus infection. Moreover, in a study in 2013, Korean investigators have shown that they are very strongly associated with hypertension itself. And these are CD28 null T cells. They release the cytokines that we have just shown are overtly released by cells infiltrating blood vessel wall in hypertension and atherosclerosis, and they can damage uh, the, uh, the vascular function. Uh, we can see that their numbers are very significantly associated with age. They are, uh, the, the, the differences are, are so uh, strong that in this study, we could actually define the age of the patient based on uh, CD28 new uh, uh, T cells. Moreover, these cells are actually correlated with blood pressure and negatively correlated with endothelial function. So all of this indicates the number of changes in the immune system, particularly in perivascular infiltration of immune cells, but also systemic activation of these cells are uh, corresponding between the, what we see in COVID-19 and uh, what we see in patients with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, cardiovascular disease. Endothelial dysfunction might be incurred by direct invasion of uh, a virus into the endothelium causing endothelitis, but also by uh, cytokine-related and immune-mediated mechanisms. So in summary, a uh, number of ongoing studies hopefully will help us understand the relationship of pre-activation of immune system in cardiovascular disease and its importance for development of immunophenotypes of COVID-19 and severity of the disease. And with this, I will uh, finish. Thank you very much. And I would like to thank uh, people who uh, work with me and uh, have contributed to this work, uh, single cell RNA seek from uh, Richard and uh, Eva and uh, uh, other people involved. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you, Thomas. That was really, really, uh, really great. Um, we've got a couple of questions that have just come in. Um, one from Lucy Smith from Salford University. She says that the, uh, there's a very interesting profile of cytokines, including IL-17, but was wondering, is there any data or are, are there any data on cytokine receptor expression? Uh, so uh, in in so far in the immunophenotyping, uh, there are uh, not uh, very very clear data on uh, uh, on cytokine receptor expression in the um, in the immune cells. However, it is important to point out that many of these uh, cytokines have receptors also on vascular cells, on endothelial cells, and uh, so on. Some of the activating uh, cytokines that we are detecting in uh, both COVID-19 and uh, uh, in hypertension uh, can actually be produced by the vessel wall. This can uh, include cytokines such as uh, interleukin uh, 15 or interleukin 18 or uh, uh, interleukin uh, uh, 10. All of them uh, can be sort of sourced from the vessel wall and modulate the process in, in addition to, uh, to what we are seeing. But in COVID-19, uh, I am not aware of, of strong studies that would actually be able to detect receptors at this stage, apart from maybe CCR7 receptor, yeah? Great. Um, we have a question from Nelson Fernandez. Um, are the CD8 positive effector cytotoxic T cells, HLA, restricted? And are there some HLA phenotypes more susceptible to COVID infection? 
So I, I think this has not been very clearly determined. And in fact, the, uh, the, the relationship to HLA phenotypes, although genetic studies are quite difficult in, uh, in this uh, respect, uh, because uh, uh, HLA cluster is, is difficult to, uh, to analyze in, in GWAS studies. Uh, but the, the signal so far, uh, the strongest GWAS study uh, showing a predisposition to a severe COVID phenotype are actually associated with one of the accessory proteins to uh, ACE2. So, uh, so I, I, I would put more a uh, bet on, uh, on this. Um, what was the second uh, aspect? Oh, hang on a sec. It's been dismissed. Just give me two seconds and I'll just drag oh, it back no. up again. Don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. Um, are there some HLA phenotypes more susceptible to COVID? Oh, so the HLA phenotype we don't know, but, uh, uh, you know, we, we would expect that uh, some of the immune-mediated diseases uh, are predisposed by certain HLA phenotypes. In relation to uh, CD8 cells uh, restriction in uh, um, uh, in HLA restricted uh, in, in hypertension or cardiovascular disease, actually this is uh, still not completely answered. And uh, uh, there are papers that are showing oligoclonal expansion of CD8 cells in the vasculature and the kidneys of uh, hypertensive, for example, animals. Uh, uh, but uh, at the same time, the, 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 actual, uh, the actual mechanisms of activation remain uh, unclear. Uh, we have evidence that, for example, uh, blockade of uh, MHC-mediated uh, T-cell activation is decreasing activation of CD8 and CD4 cells in hypertension, but at the same time, we see that sort of bystander mechanisms might be important that are more related to cytokine-related uh, activation, such as uh, mentioned IL-18. Great. Um, okay, so this is a long one, so please just bear with me. So one of the attendees today is asking, could the number of lymphocytes of observed in the patients with low lymphocyte counts be affected, for example, by dysfunctional endothelial cells recruiting the lymphocytes into tissues? If so, do you think this alone could explain the cause of the low lymphocyte count seen in coronavirus patients? Or do you think that there needs to be another reason to explain the results seen? I think it's, it's, it's an unanswered uh, problem. I think such a huge extravasation of lymphocytes uh, would be probably, in my opinion, would probably cause uh, uh, much more, uh, uh, because it's observed sometimes in, in patients with mild disease as well. Yeah? So, uh, of course, the rapid deterioration is a, is a symptom of, uh, of uh, uh, cytokine storm. I would expect that uh, to some extent it will be the uh, effect of, uh, on apoptosis and, uh, and other uh, forms of death of these cells. Uh, this was one of the reasons we were searching for entry uh, uh, receptors on uh, lymphocytes because it would be very interesting if uh, um, COVID-19 is actually in infecting lymphocytes. But so far, uh, I don't know data that would support this. And as you've seen, we have not really found uh, any of the known receptors being uh, picked up in uh, sufficient levels. Uh, so, so I think that, uh, that this, this is the, the only thing I can say. Um, so I've got a couple of questions um, that I was frantically uh, Googling uh, during your presentation around the link with IP10 and vitamin D. I, I've seen some uh, historical publications that have looked at how um, correcting vitamin D uh, levels uh, has an impact on IP10 and do you think that has potential impacts in terms of the recent studies that have identified vitamin D as being potentially useful in COVID? Uh, so as, as with always with, with the vitamins and, uh, and, and uh, modification of, of various immune responses using microelements such as zinc, I think there is unquestionably an interaction but uh, whether we can unequivocally state that uh, this would explain or support the idea that, uh, that, for example, vitamin D would be protective in the clinical setting, I think it would be an overstatement. We would really need much stronger data that's available now uh, to make such uh, such conclusion. But there are some studies showing that, uh, that vitamin D uh, uh, could be uh, affecting a, a number of cytokines and chemokines, not only IP10, but uh, again, I don't think they were really randomized. I don't think that they are uh, uh, designed in order to answer such question. And again, a, a question from my uh, sort of adipose tissue uh, background. I know that you've mentioned this, the immune cell contribution from the perivascular space. Um, and I, I may have missed it. 
would you suggest that those um, who are obese or morbidly obese that that sort of cytokine uh, storm that we see is being sort of propagated by um, the sort of perivascular adipose tissue in, in obesity? So I, I think you are absolutely correct. The, the, the situation with uh, in hypertension and obesity is, is very similar and, uh, and in a way parallel. For example, we have analyzed and looked at uh, obese adipose tissue and uh, adipose tissue in uh, hypertension. And in both cases, we have a huge uh, activation of, in some, to some extent similar, to some extent different uh, uh, cell types and, uh, and pathways. So uh, I think that uh, hypertension, obesity, and maybe diabetes as well could uh, um, constitute this sort of pre-activation status of, uh, uh, of, uh, of immune cells, of adaptive and innate immunity of NK cells as well that were uh, uh, connected to COVID-19 severity. And, uh, and therefore, uh, that could explain uh, the, um, the relationship that is clinically reported. Uh, however, again, this is a speculation, and I don't think we have so far sufficient proof to, to say that it's a fact. Great. Um, and I've just noticed that there was a follow up from Lucy uh, earlier um, asking that whether there are any data on T regulatory cells in COVID patients. Uh, so uh, do, in the uh, immunophenotyping studies, IL-10 has been one of the, uh, one of the very strong uh, uh, markers that is uh, showing up in uh, uh, the context of uh, COVID-19. And uh, the studies have not, at least the, the larger studies, have not really characterized the TREC uh, 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 levels uh, sufficiently. Uh, there is uh, th there is one small study that shows an increase in uh, uh, TREC uh, numbers of uh, uh, COVID nineteen patients, and I think this increase can be associated with uh, with compensatory response rather than uh, than causal. Yeah, and right. they must be dysfunctional as they can be rendered dysfunctional by cytokines in cytokine storm. Um, and I think probably our last question is from Sanjay, which might maybe the question we're up, we're all waiting to um, hear answered is based on the immunophenotyping uh, data in severely affected patients. What are the implications for therapeutics? What should we be targeting? Well, so far, we can only say let's give dexamethasone because that's the clinical trial is, uh, is telling us this. Uh, the use of dexamethasone is, has increased all over the world and uh, is, um, is actually also, I think, affecting. I have a, had a chat with some intensive care uh, colleagues who are saying, well, they are really seeing much uh, less uh, severe responses now. Maybe the virus is, uh, is, 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 is less uh, uh, virogenic, but uh, it's also possible that, that we've introduced certain treatments that are good. But uh, uh, based on, uh, uh, on these analysis, there is a number of uh, ideas and programs developed in order to target specific cytokines uh, and uh, try to see whether these approaches could be helpful uh, in limiting the cytokine storm. Uh, there are already approaches because these uh, immunophenotyping studies have actually shown uh, certain similarities to cytokine storm observed in certain other hereditary and uh, other conditions, uh, such as uh, in patients treated with, uh, uh, with some immune checkpoint inhibitors. And there are already trials and studies in, in these conditions uh, which uh, target uh, certain cytokines, such as IL-6 uh, uh, with tocilizumab or uh, TNF-alpha to the lesser extent. Uh, which could be uh, could be useful. So far, we do not have specific ways to target uh, 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 specific immune cell populations that uh, were implicated in COVID, but uh, hopefully we, uh, we we will be able to see some in the future. That's brilliant, and thank you for your presentation today. It was really interesting. Um, I'd like to hand back over to uh, Karen.